and Kira. It's a very, very impressive uh, accomplishment and how well it works. Um, and then of course, a lot of JavaScript. Apache 2.0 licensed, super active community. The reason, that, the way that Srini and I met was I joined the community and, and um, Srini was the first person to greet me on their Slack channel. Um, it has, a, as you'll see, uh, it has great capabilities in terms of support for SQL databases, chart types, and there is a preset cloud uh, managed service. And I should mention, of course, there is a managed service for ClickHouse as well, which we run. Um, so a nice compliment. So Srini, with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, let you roll with it for a while. Just let me know when you want me to advance slides. Perfect. Um... Hey everyone, um, we can actually go ahead to the next slide. Um, so basically the first, I kind of want to set the stage here a little bit. Um, and the my kind of, uh, you know, kind of important takeaway that I want to give everyone is the way I think about data science is the real purpose is inside. So data science is a super broad, very comprehensive field. I think these days, you know, we get caught up in this conversation of big data, machine learning, even think buzzwords like data democracy or, data literacy, but if you really go back to the first principles like and think about it, the real purpose is insight because data is a powerful way to capture information about processes and systems out in the world and model them and try to make sense of them. Uh, there's many tools and tool belts we can use, um, and this is why data scientists are usually very T-shaped because they kind of need to learn a little bit about everything. Um, and then this kind of part of the presentation, I'm really going to focus on visualization and that tool belt there. Um, so you can kind of go to the next slide. So to shed more light here, uh, I'm going to kind of talk about an infamous example here called Anscombe's Quartet. Some of you may have heard about this, but essentially Frank Anscombe was a eminent statistician in the mid to late 1900s and an early member of the statistical computing movement. He advocated strongly for the idea that a computer should be doing both calculations and graphs. Um, Many of his fellow statisticians didn't really agree at the time, felt that precise statistical calculations were more important, they were more relevant, more accurate, and computers were expensive then. So let's kind of let the computers do what they're good at, which is crunching numbers. Um, humans can do visualization on paper. Um, but to challenge the idea, he created a data set that would kind of be an adversarial example, to use a term from the machine learning community, uh, he created kind of an adversarial example that um, would fool this line of reasoning. So he created four data sets with pretty much identical summary statistics. So there's uh, kind of X. Uh, actually, if you go back real quick, I was going to oh. highlight something. Sorry. Uh, no worries. So you'll notice here that the kind of X mean, you know, Y mean sample variance for both columns, the correlation is it's basically identical for all four of these data sets. It's hard to, to tell that from this table of numbers. Um, and but you know you run the you run the calculations and that's the numbers that you get. However, when you visualize it, and we can go to the next slide now. But when you visualize it, uh, the data data sets are all over the place, right? So if, again, if the whole point of this is insight, what insights did we actually learn from these summary statistics? Um, not really a ton, I would say. Like that first data set is kind of a somewhat good, you know, line of best fit, uh, kind of kind of could be approximated well with the regression. The, the, the one on the top right corner is, is parabolic. Um, the third one is, is kind of interesting. It's a perfect line and then one outlier. And then the fourth data set is just completely bizarre. You know, it's very few cases in the real world where you'll see something like this, I'd imagine. Um, but they all have the same summary statistics. And only with visualization were you really able to understand that these are four completely different scenarios, four completely different distributions. Uh, they, we should not treat these the same way. Um, and this could be anything. This could be, you know, we could be trying to understand a nuclear reactor here or a marketing campaign. Um, and I can go to the next slide. So a modern, funnier example here is what's called a data source dozen, uh, originally published by Autodesk Research uh, by some of the research scientists. And this kind of takes the idea and takes it to the next level. They've actually built a tool where you can uh, give it arbitrary summary statistics and it will generate data sets that resemble kind of these funny symbols. Uh, my favorite one is the top one, which is a picture of a T-Rex. Um, and so the data set, again, these have the same summary statistics, which is how we would normally compress a large table of values into something a little bit easier to understand and compare. Uh, but only when you visualize the data can you understand uh, that these are very different. Uh, they have very different properties. 
you go to the next slide. Um, and so this kind of segues us a little bit to um, superset again. So these, these charts are all made in superset. These are all charts that I personally made in the last few weeks. So in the top left corner, uh, I'm looking at total vaccinations in Massachusetts, which is where I live. So I was curious to kind of figure out, can I predict where, you know, if things continue, uh, when we'll get to 60, 70 percent or 60 per 100 people vaccinated. Uh, the top, you know, the top middle, I have a visualization of consoles. So this is from 1990 to 2007, the most popular, uh, the, the, the number, the, um, the consoles with the most number of hit games. So the Nintendo DS is, is by far dominant, for example. Um, and then uh, the last one I'll quickly mention is in the bottom right corner. Last week for Star Wars, May the 4th, uh, Star Wars Day, um, I did this fun event where I just analyzed data on the original trilogy. I took all the scripts, um, put it in a CSV, um, put it in a superset, and then I just tried to map out you know, who, who's the chattiest, uh, who talks the most, who has the most number of lines. And so uh, it was kind of a fun, fun little project. Um, but all these are kind of just showcasing examples of taking just a, a giant table of numbers and, and text and turning it into something that we can understand and kind of talk about here in this presentation. You can go ahead, there we go. Um, and this leads us to Superset and how it works. And let's click the next slide. So Superset, uh, as kind of Rob hinted at earlier, modern open source BI platform. Um, it works with nearly any SQL speaking data engine. I actually have a talk tomorrow where I dive a little bit deeper into the Legos that make this possible. Um, but this, you know, we're really talking about hundreds of databases here and we want to grow that number. And since I'm a developer advocate, I was just kind of one of my joys is, is discovering and stumbling into new databases. The first thing I do is, oh, cool, this is a new database. You know, do they, does it speak SQL? Um, does it, you know, does it have a SQL alchemy driver, et cetera? And that can um, immediately, I can get a sense for how well it'll work out of the box with Superset. Um, and then there's a little bit of customization we can do to take it to the next level. Um, and for a BI platform, you want a lot of charts, right? So we have a big variety of charts, uh, over 60 right now, and that number is growing uh, very quickly. We're adding kind of a chart a week on the Bleeding Edge Master for Superset. And uh, we're actually just announced a few weeks ago that we're moving to uh, Apache eCharts. And if you go to the eCharts website, there's thousands of beautiful visualizations uh, and all those can eventually make its way into Superset. Um, and so this is kind of exciting. Uh, I joined up a year ago and it's been amazing to see the progress. Um, as Robert mentioned earlier, it's, it's kind of used, it's modern in the sense that it's using web technologies, it's using Python for the back end, uh, JavaScript for the front end. It's a large code base, and the real secret, I would say, in to managing a large code base with Python and JavaScript is bringing back types wherever you can. So we do we use type hinting in Python, we use TypeScript wherever possible. Um, all those go a long way um, to, to to making this work. Um, now let's go to the next slide. This is kind of a, a sense for the lightweight architecture of a superset deployment. So. You have these web servers, which are really just kind of, you know, most of the meat of Superset is these Python web servers that we run. And as you're, like, we have organizations um, that I've spoken with, large ones that are running Superset uh, at scale. We're talking about thousands and thousands of people weekly act accessing charts and databases, sorry, uh, charts and dashboards rather. And um, it scales like a classic web application. Um, think of any other website, any web service you use out there. It scales in a very similar way. You try to scale, you know, somewhat horizontally. You can add more servers. You can add more um, caching. So caching uh, superset deployments usually use caching in two different ways. We have a chart cache. So the first time you run a query um, that generates data that will power a chart, that data is immediately cached. So if you have, let's say, an organization in the beginning, you may only have 10 or 20 people aggressively making charts, aggressively making dashboards, and, and then publishing those to the rest of the organization. Um, and if you're if you're the data manager or the DBA, you can kind of rest a little bit easy knowing that um, each, those thousands of people are not hitting, hitting the database every single time. Um, but yeah, and then we also, in the top right corner, you'll see uh, for organizations that want to scale things up even more, and um, kind of do a little bit more out of order operation. There is an async infrastructure you can set up that's completely optional. 
Um, so instead of having the queries run every single time, hitting the database um, independent of the cache uh, for the charts, you can actually set up a messaging queue so that there's some buffer between um, the database and superset. Um, and lastly, in the top corner, you'll see the metadata database. This is kind of uh, where the where supersets aware of the different databases that you're using. Um, it's aware of the the kind of data types uh, and all of the and if you have like things like SSL enabled, all these kind of different characteristics um, you can set up here using the metadata database. Um, and this could be pretty much anything. Uh, we usually go with MySQL or, or Postgres, but Pretty much any database can be used um, that speaks SQL. And then we can move forward now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, so SuperSet can pretty much work with any SQL speaking database. Out of the box, if it has a SQL Alchemy dialect and a Python DB API 2.0 driver, then pretty much almost every feature works. Um, and there's some edge cases that you can think about implementing with just a few lines of code. So what are these two components? So DB API is basically a spec that the Python community has written. It's basically a way to, um, to turn uh, database objects, kind of mapping them to Python objects. Uh, and this specifically provides a uniform interface, whether you're connecting to a ClickHouse database or a MySQL database, uh, it kind of provides this uh, this API where you have Python cursor objects, you have connections, you have transactions, and it's kind of everyone who's built a driver that's compatible here will um, will conform to that standard. And the SQL Alchemy dialect will basically let you build queries using kind of an object model. So you can, instead of having to write queries out, one of the powerful things about having a good SQL Alchemy dialect is you can take uh, intentions of, you know, like a, a, you can have a list of just columns you want to query. You can have um, things you want in the where clause, the group buys, supports joins, and you can string those as Python objects. Um, and then when you're ready to actually run the query, SQL Alchemy will generate that query for you. Um, and will also do things like make sure that certain characters are escaped properly and so forth. And so these, these are the kind of two, I would say, superpowers that we have um, to extend database support. You can go to the next slide. Um, so the first workflow I wanted to quickly mention in Superset is SQL Lab. This is kind of our term for our browser-based SQL IDE. It's pretty, it's very focused on writing analytical queries. So you can do, you know, you can do data insert and, and DML type stuff. Uh, definitely it's supported. Uh, but the UI is not really, I would say, optimized for that as much. Uh, it's really more for exploring data, sculpting data for visualization. So if you need to reformat things, add columns, uh, move things around so that the viz layer is able to um, take, the, take the data and turn it into charts, then uh, this is kind of a place you can do that. Um, and the powerful thing in Superset is you can actually save that transfer of data as virtual data sets. Uh, where it will just live in the super, superset layer in the metadata database, essentially, where you can have, you know, you can join data and do complicated stuff, kind of last mile data prep for charts, and 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 then turn it into a kind of virtual data set, and that'll just live in the superset layer. Obviously, you can also um, create views and tables if you want the database to be aware of of this transformed data, persist a little bit better and um, kind of have a database manager. So you have kind of two different options, which is actually a natural segue to the next slide, um, which talks about the superset semantic layer. The semantic layers are kind of one of the most common questions, you know, BI vendors probably get asked. Um, you have kind of Looker, which has a much thicker semantic layer, uh, and then you have uh, other tools which are a lot lighter, but um, this is kind of, uh, the superset philosophy is we, at least for now, we want to have a relatively thin semantic layer. So we support a few different features here. Uh, you can turn the query on the left that I've written there where I took, this is the query, it's an unnest uh, function from Postgres where it's actually just taking each uh, line and splitting it into the tokens. So we can visualize you know, the, the distribution of the most common words. And I, you know, for the Star Wars event I did last week, I ended up just saving this in the in the thin superset semantic layer, um, and that became published as this data set that you'll see 
on the right. This is something the database won't really know anything about. Um, it's kind of really just living in the superset layer. And then to generate a chart, the query um, is just run against the database and uh, the, the data is provided to superset. Uh, so the, the, it's, it's relatively thin. We also have metrics and call, calculated columns. So you can do last mile aggregations and uh, simple data prep for charts. And we, we, I think we've always wanted to keep it this way and it'll probably remain this way because we don't, uh, we, we, the, super, the superset community really believes in not having much lock-in. One thing a lot of BI tools do for more speed is have a, a complicated ingest layer or another layer where you're replicating data again from your complex, expensive data stack into another, almost really a database again, uh, just to power your BI tool. And that's something, because we support so many databases, um, we want to kind of uh, always be working with the modern data stack as it changes. Um, we've we've kind of the community has opted to keep this very thin. Um, go to the next slide. In addition to SQL Lab, um, one of the powerful things uh, that we have in Superset is this no code chart builder. So you'll see in this GIF video that I'm kind of taking a chart of the table, then I switched to a pie chart and I turned into a donut chart. This is all without any coding. It's just uh, happening by picking items from drop downs. This is really powerful for non technical, um, non programmers who want to just move quickly and get things done, get to insight, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and they can still use SQL Lab if they're a little bit more SQL savvy, if the data isn't quite ready for visualization. Um, the one thing I will say about note, this Explore view is uh, it doesn't support joins yet. We're hoping to change that. Um, this year. Um, and so that's, a, again, where you have that thin semantic layer. As an escape valve, if you need to join you know, eight tables together, do something crazy um, to make the chart that you want to do, you can do that, save it as a virtual data set or a view, and then pipe it into a chart uh, and publish it. Um, and we can go to the next slide here. And so I'll quickly end my section by, by showcasing a few fun examples. So. Uh, I help manage the superset Slack community. There's a slightly outdated screenshot we have. Uh, we've added a thousand people since then, um, but I use this every week to manage our community, and I use this just to under just generally understand where people are interacting the most. Um, no surprise, the general channel is very popular since everyone joins that um, when they join the community. Um, but this is kind of just a, a fun example where you can kind of get a sense for this complicated, chaotic mess that is Slack, uh, make sense of it. Um, and I have a different view that's not pictured here where I can actually identify champions and people who are actively coming in and helping others get unstuck and uh, you know, give them some shout outs, give them some love. And we can go to the last example. So this is one that Max created, uh, who was the original creator of Superset and our CEO at Preset. Um, he created this GitHub engagement dashboard where it pulls in data from any repo uh, on GitHub. And it's it's I think it only works with public. So it's all public data. Um, so it's the public GitHub repos. It'll pull in the data. Uh, we use this to understand how our committer base for Superset evolves over time. Um, so on the top row, you have just general vanity metrics, just the number of people who are starting it, you know, PRs, interactions, that type of thing. Um, but we're interested in knowing how, uh, like, what are the organizations that are contributing to Superset and how that's changed over time. So in the middle of 2019, you'll see that green spike up heavily. That's preset. We, we do a lot of the development for Superset. Uh, and we're hoping, though, that our proportion goes down next year as we onboard other organizations that want to, you know, throw, throw their weight behind Superset. And next slide. Um, and this last uh, screenshot, kind of, it's the same dashboard. This is kind of, a way to understand some of the most active issues and PRs. Um, and at the top is a fun little area chart where you can actually see the top contributors. Um, this is kind of always a fun little competition be between the committers who want to, you know, who wants to try to figure out, you know, who's the best, who's the hot shot in the community. Um, it's purely for fun. Um, but uh, yeah, this is something we use at preset a lot. And, I, and there's a link there as well at the bottom of the slide if you want to replicate this um, on your own. And I think that's it for my part. Oh, yeah. Okay, hey, thanks, Trini, that was great. So uh, I'm gonna take over and drive for uh, a little while here. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about the 
actually the the underlying uh, plumbing to connect Superset to ClickHouse, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, creating some of these cool charts in ClickHouse itself. So let's just dive in. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is go back to something that Srini uh, touched on earlier, um, obviously a much less beautiful picture. Uh, I'm sort of the back end guy, so I'm not quite as visual. Uh, but what I want to talk about is how does Superset talk to databases in general? So as, as Srini described, you have your web, web browser, which is running all this TypeScript, and it's contacting the Superset server. And then Superset is turning around, and for any given database is, for example, if, you, if it supports SQL Alchemy, is using the, you know, going through SQL Alchemy and picking a driver that can then talk to the database and get queries done and return results. So in the case of ClickHouse, we've had a bit of a quandary because there are actually two SQL Alchemy drivers. And uh, one of them is called SQL Alchemy ClickHouse. And that was the first one that was developed. And then the other one, which came later, is called ClickHouse SQL Alchemy. So this, right from the start, is super confusing. And uh, when we started to work with, uh, with Srini and the, and the preset team, one of the questions was, OK, which of these should we really be using? SQL Alchemy ClickHouse is the one that's currently documented in Superset, developed by Marek Bavruzzo, um, when he was, I think when he was working at Cloudflare. And um, it uses, if you're a ClickHouse fan um, and, and know, understand how connectivity works, it uses the HTTP interface, which is the web interface. Um, that's one of two main ways to talk to it. It is not um, updated that much. It's, it's, and it covers a smaller uh, set of the SQL Alchemy capabilities. But an important thing that we ran into was it doesn't have TLS support. And so for, um, particularly if you're talking between VPCs in, in Amazon or uh, between cloud services, which is one of the things we're working on, this covers a lot of the ground, but it, um, not having TLS and then being kind of old, you know, sort of having some, you know, not really being updated to, to match um, uh, Superset, that was a problem and has actually hit, caused some problems in the past for Superset users. So what we're recommending is to use the other driver. And we've done some work with the maintainer, Konstantin um, Lebedev. And this is ClickHouse SQL Alchemy. It's likewise Apache 2.0. It is very actively maintained. So the most recent um, PyPy org release is March 15th, and that was actually contained a number of fixes to improve um, a superset capability. It supports TLS uh, really well. Uh, it uses an underlying driver that we'll show you in just a second. Um, and it uses the TCP uh, uh, native interface uh, for ClickHouse. There's not a whole lot to choose from between these two interfaces. That's that's not a big deal. It's more a detail of, of how it does the connectivity, and it's useful to know if you're having connectivity problems. So at this point, I would say ClickHouse SQL Alchemy, two stars. Uh, we'll probably, we intend to support it with help from uh, Preset, and um, we'll be pushing this forward to, uh, to make it even better in the future. So, this is what it looks like when it's set up uh, and you're using it. So you're going to be uh, dialing through uh, SQL Alchemy the, uh, based on your URL, which we'll show you in a second. You'll pick the ClickHouse SQL Alchemy, and then you'll talk to the ClickHouse um, Python driver, which is called ClickHouse Driver. Um, we, we do a lot of work on marketing. Um, and that can then talk to either port 9000 or 9440 on on ClickHouse, uh, these are the conventional ports for clear and TLS encrypted communications. So actually getting it to load um, or to, to set up Superset and, and, and get the driver loaded is pretty easy. Uh, there's a variety of ways to do it. I've just shown one, which is how I set it up on Ubuntu. These are pretty much the exact commands that I I did. Superset is very easy to set up locally. Um, if you can also, of course, use the preset uh, cloud service, connect to our um, alternity.cloud, but um, you know whatever you want. If you're just doing it on a laptop, you'll just go ahead and um, go ahead and install uh, pip install Superset, uh, run a few commands to basically set it up, populate the database, get some examples, and then initialize. You'll then need to pip install the ClickHouse SQL Alchemy driver. That will pull down the Python driver. And um, one thing you want to check is if you do this, just to make sure you get version 0.1.6, because uh, that has the bug fixes. 
and then you start superset and then it happily runs in a terminal window and you can start um, playing around with it. So um, connection strings. So with every connectivity interface, there's some notion of a connection URL. SQL Alchemy is no exception. And the ClickHouse driver or the, um, the ClickHouse SQL Alchemy URLs have the format um, shown above, uh, shown at the top here. It's, it's kind of an eye chart. But to make it easier, here's just two simple examples. If you set it up on your desk, if you set up ClickHouse on your desktop and, um, and SQL Alchemy on your desktop, you can just use that, that URL um, localhost default that will uh, connect to it. And notice that the type is ClickHouse plus native. It's sort of a special format or special format that will correctly pick the, uh, the ClickHouse SQL Alchemy driver. If you're going to the public endpoint, which has a bunch of interesting data on airlines, uh, taxi cabs, uh, GitHub, and other things like that, this is a um, this is the URL you would use. This is a publicly available uh, server with a read-only account, password demo, um, or user demo, password demo um, that's available and you can use for testing out things like Superset. So with that, you'll be able to connect. So let's just show an example. When you're actually in Superset, there is a tab that covers, that allows you to add databases. You just go into that, and then there's a plus that you can click, and you get this add database uh, dialog. So you just give it a name, and then you put in your, um, your URL. <coughs> Excuse me. I think it's a really smart idea to go ahead and do test connection on this. Uh, because there's, it's pretty easy to make typos. Um, if you're copying that URL, it should just work, but there's other reasons why the database connection might not work. So I always test it. And then when it, it says, um, you know, database connection looks okay, and then you go ahead and add it. And at that point, you're you have successfully linked Superset to ClickHouse. So that opens up opportunities to have a lot of fun with your data because you've got this great visualization on the one hand and in the case of the public endpoint, you've got a bunch of interesting data. Uh, the GitHub data set runs to three, point, uh, three, three some billion rows. I'm gonna be focusing on airline data, which is a relatively svelte uh, 196 million rows. Um, let's start with how we, we use it. So I think it's helpful as a user, I found it helpful at least, as a as a user, uh, relatively new user of Superset, to just understand what the architecture is underneath, which um, uh, Srini uh, uh, described in his portion. But you can basically think of the database connection as being kind of the bottom layer, and that gets you to the database. And then you have this semantic layer on top of it, and there's two kinds of data sets in that. There's what's called a physical data set, and for ClickHouse, that just maps directly to a table. And then there's a virtual data set, which is just a query. And as Srini says, the database has no idea what you're doing. It just sees it as an ordinary query. And then you can build charts on top of both of these and attach them to dashboards. It's super easy. So I'm going to go through some of the basic steps. Um, first of all, to create a time series chart just on top of a, um, a physical data set. So we already created the database connection. Uh, but that's the first step. You create your database connection that gets you connected to ClickHouse. You create the physical data set. So that creates a semantic, that's that's a, your semantic layer entity that points to the table. And then we're going to create the chart. And we're going to, for this, go ahead and use the codeless um, charting, which enables us to get the query completely generated uh, for us. So this is something that practically anybody with a little bit of a notion of how databases and visualization work could do. So the physical data set is really easy to create. All you do is you go in, there's another uh, tab for data sets. It's under databases. You hit the plus, it pops up this dialog. You select your ClickHouse connection. So there it is. And then you can select your schema. So ClickHouse has a notion of databases as uh, many of you on this call know, um, or on this, on this talk know. And so we're going to pick the default schema. There's only one in this case. And then we're going to pick a table. So, and what the, one of the, actually some of the bug fixes that we worked on together were to make sure that this, this metadata selection worked right. There were some 
that there actually are some problems um, in the older versions of both drivers. So this, this is one of the reasons why you want to be up to date. So you go ahead and select that. I'm selecting on time. That's my airline data. I'm going to press add. And at that point, I have a physical data set. And it pops up into this list of under the data tab of data sets. And there it is. And what's kind of cool about, uh, Srini, I have to say this is something I really like about, about, about uh, preset is once this thing is in the list, I just click on this link. There's a link to on time. You just click on it. That's all you do. And then you're actually, you're in this, um, uh, you know, you're basically creating a chart. So, and this is an example of the codeless chart creation that, um, that Trini talked about. So what I do is I want to create a time series chart that shows flights per month by carrier. So carriers are airlines. And uh, so I'm going to pick time series chart. That's really important. And then as soon as I pick a time series chart, um, uh, Superset is smart enough to know, hey, I need a time, I need a time dimension somewhere. So it can see the, it can read the data set and it can see that we have this thing called flight date, which is a, a date data type. And it correctly recognizes that as being a, a time dimension. We can set a time grain. So this is another great thing that BI tools in general do and Superset is very good at. We can say, hey, we want to divide it up by months. So we're going to reduce the granularity. We the, it's a date, so it's actually uh, every every flight has a day attached to it, but we can reduce that granularity down to month. Um, and then a time range, in this case, I'm going to select the previous calendar year, so 2020. And then I can select um, my metric. I'm just going to be counting flights. This is one that's just built in and automatically appears. I select it, and then I'm going to group by carrier. Really pretty simple. And then as soon as I do this, um, in fact, usually when you're in the editor, It'll be kind of dynamically running this um, at most, you know, when you make changes, you go up and press this run button up here, and then it shows you an example of your chart and also shows you your data down below. So as Srini was saying, you can then sort of play around with, hey, what columns do you have and stuff like that. So this is incredibly easy. And one of the things that's really cool about it is it goes ahead and as, as we've have mentioned, it generates the SQL for you. And this is, so this is the, you can go in if you're curious and, or if, if you're not sure what it's doing, you can actually go and there's, if you hit this um, pop down over here um, on the right side, there's a little menu here and you can go actually see the query. And this is what shows, this is what comes up when, when you do it, you can copy it out, but this shows you some nicely created, really some nicely formatted, um, uh, uh, ClickHouse SQL that will get us the information we want. So that's all there is to creating a chart that shows um, a time series. And when you save the chart, you then have the option of sticking it in a new dashboard or an existing one. Um, it's very straightforward. And then I won't go into dashboard editing, but it's very, very, very straightforward, a nice visual editor where you, where you can move them around. So that's a time series. Let me give another example, which is to create a chart on a virtual data set. So this is something where you're going to want to build a query that abstracts away from the ground table. For example, maybe we want to do a join. That just happens to be the example I'm going to do. Uh, so we want to we want to build up some additional semantics and and then have that available to be used in a um, in in charts. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to create create a virtual um, data set. And for that, we go into the SQL, uh, the, the query editor that uh, Srini just showed you a minute ago. And we're going to create a ClickHouse query that refers to one or more ClickHouse tables. And then we're going to save that as a virtual data set. And then from that, we'll go ahead and create the chart. So, and 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 I'll show you the, the, the SQL that gets generated, but it basically uses subqueries um, to, uh, to generate this information. So um, here's the query. So um, what I'm going to do is create a query that, among other things, shows flights between origins and destinations um, by date. And a key thing here is it's going to do a couple of joins because I'd like to get the latitude and longitude of my origin airports and my um, 
and my destination airports. And the reason for this is so I can do nice visual map queries uh, or dis displays where I'm showing flights, uh, you know, where I can show the flights um, actually on, on screen. So this query looks kind of horrible. Um, it's a fairly efficient, if you're familiar with ClickHouse uh, SQL, this is uh, something that would be uh, somewhat familiar to you. For those of you that are not, or for those of you that just like visualization, here's what we're really doing. We have the on-time uh, uh, data. These are the fields that we're, you can see the fields we have over on the right. And then we're joining on airports. Um, we're doing two joins uh, using the IATI, IATA code. That's the um, uh, the airport code like SFO or, or uh, um, EMW. Um, and then that allows us to get the lat and the long. So this is something ClickHouse, ClickHouse does quite efficiently. So we're going to construct this, and we're going to do it inside that query lab, in, inside the SQL lab. And once we're happy with it, and and ClickHouse, or the, the uh, superset gives you a lot of help, as as Srini was showing. Um, it's you know as you select um, things like tables, it's going to pop them up. You can see all the. Um, uh, you know, you can see the values. It it has it's kind of smart about the query editing. So um, this is very helpful. And then of course you can run it. You see a sample of your data, um, and and you can figure out okay, does this look approximately like what I want? In this case, the answer is yes. And so then you go ahead and just press save. And at that point, um, let's see if I show this. Ah, here we go. It will automatically allow you to create to save it as a virtual data set. And so you just go ahead and save it as a new data set. It's now going to appear in the virtual uh, data set list. And if you just press save and explore, it will pop you right in and you can start building it. As, you can start building charts off it. So I go ahead and do that. And here I am. And now I'm looking at my, um, my, so my data set that I've selected, it's up on the, it's up on the, um, upper left so flight stats between i think uh, airports and then it shows the data the the columns that i have and i can now go ahead and again do a codeless um a, a chart where the the sql necessary to operate on this is going to be generated for me by uh, clickhouse so the chart type i'm going to use is called a deck deck.gl arc and you can see an example of it over on the right it will pop up a map and you can now see if you have destinations and origins, you know, sort of in, in the same row, it will happily draw a line between them, which is pretty cool. And what we're doing here is constructing one where we are showing um, all the flights again in the previous calendar year. And they're basically where the flight started in SFO. This is totally easy to build. It took me about once the thing, you know, once the, um, uh, once the virtual data set query was done, that was the hard part, actually. This took about four minutes to build. So one thing I should say is the chart types um, for the, the geographic displays, they require a map box token. So if you're installing this yourself, you're going to have to go get one of those tokens. There's, it's, it's covered in the docs. And um, I, I don't, in, I, Shreen, just a quick question. In preset, um, preset cloud, do you do that automatically? Yeah, we have a just a single map box key that we just pay. Uh, yeah. So yeah, all on preset cloud, you won't have to deal with any of that configuration stuff. It'll just yep. work. Yeah, it's um I did a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, so because I we were also working on like, hey, how do we provide this to the community? And so a lot of this stuff I did on my laptop. But preset cloud actually is great. Uh, one of the things I really like about it is you go there and you have exactly the same capabilities, but you didn't have to work to get it. So it's uh it's really, it's really very handy. So that creates this geographic chart. Um, interesting thing, again, if you're a database person, so I'm a geek, I always like to know what's happening underneath. This, it, you can again, go look at the generated query. And what you'll see is superset is going to generate a query and the, the virtual data set ends up being just created as a subquery. Um, which is which it selects off, and then it has a bunch of filters around it that represent all the all the information I filled in on that chart screen. It turns out you might look at this and say, "Oh, you know, that could be inefficient." But it turns out, of course, that ClickHouse is smart enough 
that it can take these filters and push them down to the base table so, um, so that in fact the performance of the query is quite good. Um, again, that's a, I, I have to say in, in using this, the, the, the fact that it can generate these queries is really great and, and makes it very, very productive to use. So uh, one final chart, I love word clouds. Uh, when I, I saw an example from one of our customers and I thought I gotta get me one of those. So I'm using that same, uh, this is what I mean about creating a, a data set, which uh, you know has a, you know lots of additional information. Uh, it has lat long, but we can use that same exact data set to do a word cloud that shows the most popular airports by departures. So in this case, we do word cloud as a visualization type. Um, Let's see. Oh, a chart type A. It looks like the arrow is pointing uh, in the wrong place. Uh, take the time range here. That's the time dimension. Um, uh, my boxes got a little bit mixed up. Uh, series. So the origin. So pick the you know pick the data type that's going to get us uh, get us our words. Uh, the metric for sizing the words is the sum of flights, and um, just uh, give a row limit, and and it will automatically pick the top 100. So it does kind of a top end query, query for you automatically. I don't think I bothered to uh, show the query, but this one is correct. I, I've checked it carefully. So in summary, it's really easy to, you know, once you've got things uh, set up and you've got access to data, it's really easy, even if you're a back end person like me, not, not known for taste and color and beautiful displays, it's really easy to create stuff that, that um, that visualizes your data in imaginative and very helpful ways. And um, creating, you can put these together in the um, in dashboards very easily. There's a visual editor. Uh, I, as I said, when you save these, you have the option to just pop them into a dashboard and you can move them around and size them and things like that. And this is just an example of two of them shown in the same in the same dashboard. So it's a really powerful tool. Um, we are, there's lots more stuff you can do. As, as Srini showed, you know, if you're a ClickHouse user, there's just a huge number of, of, of displays. One of the things that's really impressive about Superset is just how many there are. And it sounds like you guys are working on putting even, making that, making that plethora even bigger. Um, and I think that one topic that we don't explore in this talk, but I think is a really interesting one, is the the superset caching and clustering one of the big issues that you have with uh, with data warehouses? This is a basic conflict between the algorithm of a data warehouse, which is designed to seize all possible resources to make a query run as quickly as possible. There's a conflict between that and high concurrency. The reason being, if a lot of people come in, the data warehouse is not smart enough to say, "Oh, you've already run that query." Well, in it, it can sometimes, but it just really doesn't know enough about what they're doing to answer that question accurately. Um, but with the caching, what you can do is by having a superset taking care of populating what amount to cubes in the semantic layer, you can now support many more people to uh, be running these queries, showing these dashboards, and it really gives you a path to, for example, building multi-tenant systems very effectively. And uh, so I think this is something I, plan to explore further. And speaking of plans for the future, um, well, on, on our side, um, improve, this, uh, improve the ClickHouse support. Um, so if you do see something go wrong, it's not a feature. It probably is a bug. There's a few out there uh, that we know about. Uh, as we track them down and find out where they live, we will fix them. I th There's a couple that are still you know, sort of display issues with data types. Those are things that probably have to be fixed on the superset side. We have at least one data conversion error that I've seen that I can't reproduce, um, but it looks like it looks like one of ours. Um, we'd like to build out uh, and document uh, usage examples. We have a blog article on the setup. There'll be another one shortly on giving the examples that I just showed you. And then um, we're working um, together on integrating uh, preset cloud and alternative.cloud. And um, this includes things like, you know, just making sure services are available in the same regions and uh, enabling automatic setup of OWASP Private Connect. Um, if you're, we already have customers uh, using both clouds and we're working with them and uh, 
together with the preset team to make that work as well as possible. So um, with that, I think we're done. Um, oops, doesn't, oh, here we go. Um, so open it up for questions. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is, Srini, thank you so much for doing this with me. It's just been a real pleasure working with your team. Yeah, likewise. This was a, a fun collaboration. Uh, I think also just a, another showcase of the power of open source. Um, yeah, this was, this was fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, oh, we've got a question here. What is data movement cost between the two cloud services? Um, I, one thing I will say about the open source is, yeah, just to expand on that a little bit. So we had one of the reasons we were able to to, to improve this really quickly. And the reason was, I, you know, on both sides, the reason was we can both see each other's code. Moreover, the um, the ClickHouse SQL Alchemy driver and the, and the, uh, and the ClickHouse uh, Python driver are maintained by a pretty active um, person. He does it as a side project on the weekends. And, you know, we were able to queue up things and just say, hey, Constantine, can you spin us a, you know, another PyPy.org um, build? And he, the, his his code has really good unit tests. So we were able to push stuff out, you know, both see the problems and then get fixes to them very quickly on both sides. So I think this is, that that really is where the open source helps enormously. There's a question here by Jeffrey too on native driver yeah. work against load balance set of ClickHouse servers. Uh, is there a question? Is there any way? No, the question, uh, okay. Hey Jeff, how's it going? Uh, so I got a friend here. Uh, hmm. The answer is no, uh, that it's not built in right now, but that's actually a really good, that's actually a really interesting question. Now I'll tell you what we do in the cloud is, is um, we do, uh, we use um, uh, Amazon, um, uh, elastic load balancers to uh, to distribute across. So in the cloud, it's actually not too hard to um, to just put a, a a load balancer in there. And in fact, one of the reasons that uh, that we had to do the driver updates, uh, there's a feature in TLS support is we support um, we now support SNI in that driver, so it's able to do the server name indications that will allow it to uh, you know come into a single entry point. So that you don't have to have a bunch of load balancers, you can have a single entry point, basically that handles um, the next level down of host names. Uh, so we're doing it with load balancers, as opposed to putting something in the in the driver itself. And uh, let's see. Uh, oh, a question from my thanks, Srini. Uh, yeah, that blog article. Go ahead and hit that up. I'm going to be posting another one. I hope in a couple of days that we'll talk about the building of the. Uh, you know, sort of get you started on building things uh, to the extent that it's not totally obvious already. And then a uh, question from Minway, data movement costs between the two cloud services in the same region. Um, there is a cost, but, um, and this is an interesting question, um, it's not very high. So, and the reason is that that yes, you're moving data between regions um, or, or between say VPCs if if you're using the cloud services, but the amount of information compared to the, because we're dealing with aggregates, the amount of information that we're, we're pulling out relative, you know, relative to the, um, the size of the underlying databases is tiny. It's only, so like in the examples I showed you, I was pulling a few hundred rows out of data sets that generate, you know, that, that run into the hundreds of millions. So this is a little bit different from cases like if you're familiar with Elastic, where in fact, rather than querying, you're pulling the actual data itself because you're, you're reading documents or you wanna do things like log analysis, the amount of data that you're moving is relatively small. So yes, there's a data, there's a price, there's a transfer cost, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's not gonna be anywhere near a significant cost in most cases. Good. Uh, and let's see any, I'm looking at the Q&A box. Any other questions? We'd be happy to stay a couple more minutes and take them. Okay. Um, you know, one thing I should say is that, Srini, do you want to talk about your Slack channel? Because I think for people that are coming to uh, 
uh, you know, coming to work with preset and superset, that's a really great resource. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just pasted a link uh, to our community tab on the uh, Apache Superset website. Uh, you'll see a Slack link right there to join. Um, but yeah, Slack is a great way. You know, I I try to be as responsive as possible. Um, and I, I, I basically, you should see my Slack. I have like 20 different Slack communities <laughs> in all the communities I'm in. But my work Slack and the Superset Slack are the first two. Um, so it's yes. a good place to get help. Um, you know, I'm if you have questions on drivers or um, or like a use case, like someone just asked a question about uh, doing a, using a filter, a dashboard filter to filter a group by in a SQL query, right? Um, documentation, uh, bugs you're encountering, um, or just in general, just you just want to hang out there. Like definitely, I encourage you to join and feel free to ping me uh, when you're there. Um, but yeah. Yeah, and I'm on this community. Don't hesitate to DM me if you have, um, you know, we're watching for stuff related to ClickHouse. Um, I'll either see it or I'll probably get a, you know, probably get a ping yeah. from Srini that there's something that needs to be answered. Feel free to, to meet us over there. You can also come to the um, uh, the ClickHouse uh, Slack channel. Um, obviously, if you're doing Superset, that's a better, it's better to come to the Superset side because you have, you um, you have everything there. We, have, Shrini, we have one last question. It looks like, um, does the backend cache do partial caching, old buckets versus new data coming in? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think right now it's a it's a relatively a simple cache. Uh, the, it, it, it's kind of completely mapped uh, to a query itself. I think eventually there's been some interest here, especially because Superset was originally created for real time analytics and Stuff of like that obviously that's where clickhouse also shines um and so we're not the cache right now is not super smart about uh, data in a specific time interval um i think that that seems to be what the uh, jeffrey's asking about right now uh, as far as i know the the cache is pretty linked to okay the data has changed let's kind of refill the whole thing um and so that's kind of a limitation but it is open source if that's something you want to help help contribute i'm happy to kind of you know get you to work with the other core contributors um as well and um yeah but it, it's something we want to change um but right now it's it's it, it, i don't think it quite does this yeah one thing that if you know for that problem and i jeffrey i don't know if this is helpful but i would definitely also think in terms of using materialized views so that when the cache refresh occurs you're refreshing a smaller um a smaller amount of data since obviously and and you have the advantage on top of that of having pre-aggregation um, uh, done. This is a topic that uh, we're both super interested in. I think it is one of the basic conflicts that you get or trade-offs you get in scaling of uh, of data warehouse systems, particularly uh, ones with a lot of a lot of users, is how to build these caches in such a way that that you can get information from the data warehouse efficiently, but then also enable a lot of concurrency. Yeah, totally. And I also, Jeffrey, just linked to our docs page on how the cache does work. Um, so just so you can get some sense there as well on yeah. even like, how do you know if the charts are being cached? Like, because if you're deploying it on your own, you have to explicitly set up a, a Redis cluster or something else to do the caching. So cool. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, we're we're at the top, almost at the top of the hour. Thank you so much, everybody. We're we're just delighted to have you here. I hope this was helpful. Come visit us on the Slack channels, and we'd be glad to talk further with you. Sweet. Thanks, Trini. Talk to you soon. Awesome. Happy All Wednesday. Right, bye. Bye. Happy Wednesday.